<laughs> Safkin said he's not shaving until we release beta. <laughs> he's got a nice beard. I was going to say, that's going to be a long beard. This episode is sponsored by Hired.com. Every week on Hired, they run an auction where over a 1,000 tech companies in San Francisco, New York, and L.A. bid on JavaScript developers, providing them with the salary and equity up front. The average JavaScript developer gets an average of 5 to 15 introductory offers and an average salary of over $130,000 a year. Users can either accept an offer and go right into interviewing with the company or deny them without any continuing obligations. It's totally free for users, and when you're hired, they also give you a $2,000 signing bonus as a thank you for using them. But if you use the Adventures in Angular link, you'll get a $4,000 bonus instead. Finally, if you're not looking for a job but know someone who is, you can refer them to Hired and get a $1,337 bonus if they accept a job. Go sign up at Hired.com slash Adventures in Angular. Ready to master Angular? Oasis Digital offers Angular Bootcamp, a three-day in-person workshop class for individuals or teams. Bring us to your site or send developers to our classes in St. Louis or San Francisco, angularbootcamp.com. This episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is the provider I use to host all of my creations. All the shows are hosted there, along with any other projects I come up with. Their user interface is simple and easy to use, their support is excellent, and their VPSs are backed on solid-state drives and are fast and responsive. Check them out at DigitalOcean.com. If you use the code AngularAdventures, you'll get a $10 credit. This episode is sponsored by Teller, the makers of Kendo UI. Kendo UI integrates seamlessly with both AngularJS 1.x and 2.0. It provides everything you need to integrate with AngularJS out of the box, bindings, component configuration directives, template directives, form validation event handlers, and much more. And yet, Kendo UI tooling does not depend on AngularJS, so if you want to use it with Angular or not, that's totally up to you. You can check it out at kendoui.com. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 68 of the Adventures in Angular show. This week on our panel we have Aaron Frost. Hello. Ward Bell. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from devchat.tv. I want to do a quick shout out for jsremoteconf.com. We're looking for speakers and attendees. So if you want to speak or you want to attend, uh, go to jsremoteconf.com. We also have two special guests. We have Jeff Cross. Hello. We also have Rob Wormald. Hello. So we brought you guys along to talk about Angular 2, and I think the interesting thing that we were discussing on the mailing list was uh, reactive programming in Angular 2. And now I'm really curious what you have to say, because object.observe got yanked out of the spec. So, <laughs> Well, that, uh, uh, you know, a while back when object.observe was spec'd, we were pretty excited about it, and we had done some designs with it and looked at it, but we abandoned that idea a long time ago. There were a lot of performance implications with it that uh, uh, were not favorable for, for what we wanted to do. Um, so we, we made change detection faster than, than it was negative one, but uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I uh, wasn't too sad to see object.observe go. I just missed it as soon as I realized it didn't do anything with defined properties. Yeah. So what what are we stuck with? I mean, what are we going to use now? <laughs> For in Angular or in general? Uh, yes, we've got uh, <laughs> so in Angular too. We we have we still have dirty checking, but it's uh, it's more optimized and it's much faster and it's more pluggable than it was in Angular one. So it's actually really fast, and we've got some some good benchmarks showing that. And then you have more than dirty checking. You have two other options. What are the other options? Well, as I recall, checking. Uh, there was a, mm-hmm. a support for immutability mm-hmm. and uh, for an observable object. Has that changed? I don't, I don't mean object.observe, but... So those are ways to tell change detection whether or not to dirty check something and also to tell it. It's essentially new ways to tell it whether or not you could skip over this during dirty checking right. or not. Mm-hmm. So yeah, uh, immutability and um, things like using async primitives with this idea we call pipes and templates make it where you can have these bindings to promises or observables in your templates that change detection can automatically know not to dirty check that unless a new value is emitted from the promise or the observable. That's big. Yeah. Or it could be big. It could be big in certain scenarios. Mm-hmm. Maybe, Do people know what dirty ex- check I was going to say, maybe you should explain that, because I, I still don't really understand that, and I'm, I'm supposed to understand that. So, well, 
I won't try to explain it in too much depth. Victor is, is the genius on it, but uh, uh, it's essentially it, you go through the tree of bindings in your app at a given time. So all the component properties that are in your templates being used, those are kept record of in Angular. And it goes through each of those bindings and sees uh, anytime there's a change, like something, a user does something or you get some new data from a service, uh, Angular will run uh, change detection, which looks at each of these properties, each of these bindings, and sees if its value has changed since the last time change detection run. Uh, and that's called dirty checking. Is is the value dirty and different before? Right. And there's a huge graph that it could be walking down and being able to clip that graph because you know you don't have to worry about following anything down a particular path. Mm -hmm. can save on that enormously and mm -hmm. uh so that's what those other options are that we were talking about they say yeah i don't have to look at that one it keeps going and and i think we're all familiar in angular one with what happens when you have lots of watches which is essentially what we're talking about here during a digest cycle you have a digest cycle in a2 really you just we don't have to kick it off mm -hmm. and it has to compare uh prior uh, you know current value to prior value and this yep. this means fewer comparisons yeah, and, and in addition to giving more control, it's actually a lot faster and a lot more memory efficient than scope digests were in Angular 1. So even when you do have to run, it's a lot faster and it doesn't generate a bunch of garbage uh, that has to be collected. So I feel kind of lost because I thought we were talking about reactive. Sorry. Maybe I don't know what reactive is and all of a sudden... We're going down this whole, I mean, this other tangent of not reactive. <laughs> Unless I think I don't Ward know what wants it is to and reactive is this. Ward just wants to avoid the subject. I think. No, no, I'm sorry. I did. I don't know actually even how we when we roll the tape back, we'll figure out how we got it here. But you're Chuck. right, Aaron. No, it's not Ward. Uh -huh. It was Chuck. So, so actually, how do we transition from this to reactive? Because I agree, this is. Not about reactive at all. We just we could throw something in the middle. We could explain the special. It's kind of it's awkward to talk about it even sometimes. But the special relationship that Jeff and I have. Oh, is, is this now the right time? I mean, it's as good as time as any. We're trying to transition from yeah, a yeah. thing to a to thing want another thing. So Jeff and I have a, a special relationship. Jeff, why don't you explain it? Which relationship is this? Our GDE buddy relationship? <laughs> is there a love child involved? I don't, oh, I, I sure don't hope know. so. There's no legitimate ones. Yeah, there's no legitimate ones. But the buddy, the buddy system. Okay. Uh, Aaron is my GDE buddy, uh, which means he and I, we, I don't know, how would you explain it? We, we collaborate. I'm like his connection into the Angular core team, and he's my connection to the outside world. So if I want to know something about what's outside of Google, I just ask Aaron, and he, he enlightens me. And so yeah, like you're, you're, the, you're the Yoda to his Luke Skywalker kind of thing? I, yeah, I think that's a good way to, to For Googlers, say. they don't know how to use Google because mm -hmm. it's just so last year. He asks me non-Google things, and I Google them and get the answers. Yeah, we, I query the index directly sometimes, but we don't have the nice UI that, that you guys have. Yeah, exactly. So this is. So the, I'm this... so glad we got to reactive this way. I'm really. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm interested to see how we tie this back. Go ahead, Aaron. There we go. No, so now that we're done explaining that, let's talk about reactive. Okay. Yeah. Good. Nice. Smooth. So, see that? Seamless. <laughs> so smooth. Seamless. Seamless. It's a seamless transition as I've ever heard. This is why they pay me the bucks, folks. Mm -hmm. Well, let me give you my reaction to your love child story mm -hmm. here. No, so, Rob, <laughs> pull us out of the fire, buddy. What is your vision for Reactive and Angular 2? Well, so, like, the segue is, is, right, like, all that stuff we just talked about, it's still the same, and Angular 2 is not scary and doesn't change everything that you love about Angular 1, right? Like, that's the way that it works today. All, all still works, but it works better. But if you want to do all this shiny new reactive stuff, right, we've got a whole bunch of new options for it. Is that a Bro, decent explain segue? reactive right? like, stuff. Yeah, explain reactive stuff, because I think a lot of people, like, they know Angular, and they don't know anything beyond Angular. Mm -hmm. So I don't think a lot of people understand myself included what exactly is reactive because it's one thing to be like hey this is how you do it in angular but what is it sure. so like this this is the way i'd explain it right so you know what a promise is right you know how a promise works right yep. and and you know what an array is and you know how an array works right so 
reactive programming, I think, at least in the way that we talk about it, is about this new thing that's called an observable. And an observable is like the primitive for reactive programming, right? So if you have a promise, and a promise is async, right? Like a promise, you, you do something, it takes some time, and then you get a value back. And then an array, right, like is, is a collection of many things, right? So you have like an array of numbers, an array of things. And so an observable is like a, the combination of those two things. And so we use observables or this idea of observables to make things reactive. And what I mean by that, right, is so like when you when you click a button on a screen, right, typically an Angular one that would fire a method. Um, and then you then you'd call a function and you do some other stuff and you do some other stuff and you kind of like do steps of things. And if you think about it, clicking a button many times is kind of like a collection, right? Like you could think about a bunch of button clicks as an array of button clicks. And the way to kind of think about reactive is that reactive takes this idea of lots of things happening over time, button clicks, requests, whatever, and lets you think about them kind of like arrays, but lets you do asynchronous things at the same time. So like this is a terrible explanation. I should have my notes in front of me, right? But, so let me try let me try something there from where you're going. Uh, we think place. of it we think of it as arrays as a sequence in space. And I think of the stream as a sequence in time. Is it almost like an array in time? And I think stream is something that people can kind of get their heads around. They can imagine a stream of events flowing at you. Right? You got that, Aaron? If they feel right, you got yeah, things. It's these things beautiful. are coming at you. And so if you if you could build an a, a array of them that was that where the dimension was time instead of space, then you could start saying, well, I'll take the first thing that happened and the next thing that happened and the next thing that happened and the next thing that happened. And you'd know what to do. Now, if it's an array in space, we have things like filter up. You know, you have a filter thing where you could say, I want everything in the array that is an even number. Right. And you have no problem. None of us who have been in JavaScript for a while can have a problem going array dot filter. And then we check each value and say, is it odd or even? Right. You good? Say yes. He's distracted. He's distracted. Not. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Totes me goats, bro. All right. So <laughs> I just think of this is how I think of it is I just say, well, I ought to be able to have a filter over an array in time in which I examine each event as it arrives and decide if it's interesting to me or not. And I'd love to have a filter operator over events in time, just as I love having a filter operator over an array in space. There was a time when I didn't have one of those, all right? There was a time before filter, but in which I had to manually do everything with the array. And, that, and there was a time that we know today in which we had to deal with each event as it arrived without any kind of abstraction like filter. But now with reactive programming, we start to have... It's very similar kinds of uh, operators like filter and map and so forth in which we can deal with with streams, which I think of as an array in time. That's my shorthand. What do you think, Rob? So I, like this, this is the way I would put it. And I guess that let's talk about reactivity first, right? Like reactivity is, is about reacting to things that happen, right? It's about like the program is pushing stuff to you. Mm -hmm. So like go back to that button clicks example, right? Like clicking a button a bunch of times that's a stream, right? It's a stream of button clicks. And each time you get a button click, you're going to do something with it, right? So it's like that's the kind of basic way to think about it, is that reactive programming is about dealing with streams of stuff. And so if you think about like an Angular application, what you would do is you'd take a button click and you'd make a request and you would stick it into your view, right? To get the most basic way of doing things. And reactive programming is just about giving you a tool to deal with all these things in the same way. And so it means like you can take a stream of button clicks and like, like Ward was talking about, turn those button clicks into requests and then turn those requests into responses and turn those responses into UI, right? Like it's that kind of idea of taking a thing that's being pushed to you, changing it to something else, changing it to something else, and then putting it into the view. And like that, that's the really basic idea of it before you get into like the mechanics, right? But it's reactive program is just about dealing with streams of stuff. And all we're talking about really is, is giving you the tools to deal with streams of stuff. And so Ward was talking about filters and maps and all of that. So it's all the stuff you do with arrays, except you can do it with events and all that stuff that you normally do. 
We're doing a crappy job of explaining this right now. So why is this a good <laughs> thing? What problem are we solving? I think that's the problem. When I talk to people about Reactive, and I'm sure when you do it, it's like we immediately dive into how it works without really starting from, like, what does this do for us that I don't just do today in a callback? Because programming is hard, right? Like asynchronous programming is hard. It's it's there's a lot of stuff to think about. There's a lot of stuff that happens outside of what you're doing. Like you got to worry about callbacks, and you got to keep things in order, and you got to keep like there's a lot that happens. And so for me, promises it's about, like, help with that though, right? Like yeah, promises. I know Ben Lesh is going to get in and punch me in the face for saying that, yeah. but um, yeah, promises are definitely an improvement over callbacks. Uh, it, it gets hard for things where you're actually reacting to events, then your callback, or you, it's hard to express that as a promise because it's going to happen multiple times. But yeah. true. For me, yeah, promise right. is great when it's one and done. Yeah. I go and make an XHR request and I expect it to be really simple. You had to go there, Ward. One and <laughs> done. I had to. One and done. What is XHR, a four-letter word? Oh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a four-letter word with the one dropped out. I mean, I make a asynchronous request for data, and I expect the world to be very nice to me, and um, the server's always there, and it always gives me the value I asked for, and everything is good. You know, the world as it really is, the fantasy world we live in, then it's kind of like, okay, I, I got one event, and then I'm done. So promises make some stuff easier. Observables make that even better. How? Well, promises are lacking some properties that, that, that make it hard. For one, they're, they're not cancelable. Uh, so once you start a promise chain, you have to hack out of it. You can cancel the rest of the chain by throwing and having some handler at the end of the promise chain that will uh, say, okay, it was, a, it was an okay throw. They threw inside of the promise just to stop the rest of the work from happening. So that's one big thing. So like with async things where you don't want any more work to be done or you just want to free up resources, then with promises, you you have to hack around it. And there have been some proposals on, I'm not sure the state, but they proposed adding abort to promises, particularly with the fetch spec, because people want to be able to abort requests. Um, I'm not sure where that went. I think there were some fundamental issues with that uh, that made it difficult. But the other thing is that promises, they do work automatically. If you have a promise, it's already doing work. And when I say do work, I mean like it's already made a, an HTTP request or something and you just wait for that promise to resolve with the response and, and it's done. Regardless of if you, if you actually want to do anything with it. And that's usually fine. People design apps knowing that once you create a promise, like make requests, then you've already accepted the cost of doing work. But by deferring the work until some Something's actually subscribed to it. So like if I have an HTTP request, if I just have it there and then wait until people subscribe to actually create the XHR object and execute the request, it, it opens up more doors for how I can architect my, my application and share things between my application and keep uh, my system's resources uh, that are being used minimal. I think that better than like the things about being better than promises, right? Like I think we argue about that a lot, but I think that it's it's more about for me it's like the, it's unification, right? Like promises are really good at HTTP requests, but they're not good at events, right? Like you can't describe button clicks as that, but you can describe a request in an observable, right? So it allows you to treat all of the sync things that you do. So instead of thinking about how events are different than callbacks, are different than promises, right? Are different than event listeners, or all these things are different. They have to be handled differently. And it means you can't plug them together really nicely. But observables can represent all of these things, right? Like you can represent a request with an observable. You can represent button clicks with an observable. And if they're all the same basic thing, it allows you to hook them up in really powerful ways. It allows you to think about stuff in a specific sort of single, unified, consistent way. And doing that, I think, is probably like the biggest practical benefit, right? Like you don't you can just plug one stream of things into another stream of things into another stream of things. Like that's the secret sauce for me, right? Is that you can treat button clicks and requests all the same way. And that is, while this all I think sounds like ridiculously complicated as we try to explain it poorly, right? Like it's way simpler because it's one thing. It's one thing you have to learn how it works. And if you know how that one thing works, then you just plug them together. And that makes stuff way, way easier, I think. 
So yeah, that's... essentially, it's I subscribe over here, and I've got 10 different things that can subscribe to it, and they can all do 10 different things when something happens instead of a string of promises or something else or whatever. And if I generate an entire stream of events, then all of the things that care about all the things in that stream can then react properly to get things done, including throwing their own events or triggering other processes down the line. Yep. Yeah, I mean, but with like, promises, it's... too, you can have multiple subscribers and... Oh right. Uh, yeah, that's that's yeah, that isn't a strong distinction for me. I think the composability issue is a strong one. Uh and it really comes into its own when when you're going to deal with a with true stream of events. Like when I make an XHR call, I'm not really thinking about it as a stream. I'm thinking about it as like I get one answer and I'm done. Mm-hmm. I know that's I know what Jeff was saying is also true, but th- let's think about what happens when you make a request of anything and you start getting the results back. I don't know about you guys, but I end up often writing a chain of thens, right? Dot then this, dot then that. And inside each of the thens is a call by is one or two callbacks usually one because then at the end I have a big old catch at the bottom and inside there I'm usually filtering and adjusting and pushing the next thing down the line and I could do that all right but it's kind of clunky at least I find it kind of clunky and if there if instead I could treat that as a stream and I had some nice operators over it then I'm ready to go with map and filter and and write my own, you know, delay and retry. And, and I could just chain these things together and they have semantic meaning instead of having to bury all of that thinking inside of then. And I find that ability to chain together operations on a stream to be very much friendlier to me as both a reader and a writer of the code. And then, as I said, it really comes into its own if I'm expecting that to truly be a stream in which new stuff is coming down over time rather than expecting only one thing to come down over time. So that's my reaction to it. What did I get wrong there? Ah, your reaction, your reaction. So it, basically, it's not, a, it's not a truck, right? It's a series of tubes. It's, it's kind of how this works. And so Tubular, the, like, dude. Wow, that is tubular. Yeah. Right? Well, you I, I feel like the, the, good, the example that Jeff and I keep doing, right, when we keep giving talks about this stuff, is a type ahead, right? Like I, I think a type ahead's a really good kind of basic way to think about this. So if you start with an input box on the screen, right? In the old way of doing things, you would have like a method that every time that that value changed in the box, you would call a method and you might make an HTTP request. And then like Ward said, you might then take that and then like return that and do a then and a then, right? And then you'd probably have a callback and you'd hook it back into your view. With the kind of reactive way of thinking about this, you start with this stream of letters, right? Like you start with letters, a stream of changes coming out of the input box. Mm-hmm. And all you're really going to do is each one of those little sort of events that's coming down the stream, you're going to map it. You're going to use that array operator, and you're going to map that into a request, right? And then you're going to take that request, and it's going to map into a response, and then you're going to response. And like it's this sort of flow, this tube of things that makes it really easy to reason how all these things fit together. We probably should have prepared for this a little bit better, Jeff. <laughs> it, it's all good. I mean, the the way that we kind of discover the ways to communicate about this, I think will help people kind of, okay, so it's not like this. It is like this. So when yeah. we're talking about reactive programming in Angular 2, how is that all plugged into the framework itself so that we get some of these nice things maybe automatically? Good question. <laughs> Are you going to answer the question, Rob? Sure. So <laughs> that question like, is very valuable. Thank you. That's Thank you for posing Thank that. You. Yes. <laughs> Great segue. So the first thing is forms, right? Like Angular two forms. We have ng model like you're used to, and if you like ng model, cool, keep it. But we also have forms are observable now. Forms are reactive. So it's really easy to basically get a stream of changes from a form, right? I see Rusty mm-hmm. or Rusty's head exploding over there, right? So. If you think about it, right, like every time you type in the box, you're going to get a new input value. And so you start with this reactive stream of, of model changes, if you like, right? So if you use ng change, it's kind of like that. Every time you type in the box, you get a new value in the stream. So it starts there. And Jeff can, Jeff can take the next step of that process. Oh, sure. So yeah, I guess we, we try to 
approach Angular 2 with two ways of doing most of the things you would do. Like, so you can still write templates like you would with Angular 1 where you mm-hmm. can have event bindings where you say, you know, on a click event of this element, call this method. But we're, we're trying to make the dual of that or the inverse of that possible as well by having a reactive way to do all these things. Um, we're not quite there yet, but Forms is a good example. Like you can have imperative APIs where you could have an input element that has change events that you just call a callback and you do something with. And then, um, on the other hand, you could get a hold of the observable that it's already producing and subscribe to that, so you can have a uh, a nice contained flow instead of handling everything in a callback. So, so there are other APIs like the HTTP API, which we, we touched on a little bit, is actually observable based. Uh, so, if you make an HTTP request, you get an observable back that will emit the response and then complete. And that was one of the more controversial designs of Angular 2. And we had some mailing lists where there was a lot of debate about why should we do this thing that's most of the time just a one, one off, uh, as an observable, uh, which is only going to get one response and then complete it. And I'll explain a little bit why and then Ward can say why it's a bad idea. But, uh, <laughs> The, Ward, the main under the bus, Ward. <laughs> and like, true, true story, you can go back and read that thread. And I am like one of the most. No, no, vocal- nobody read that thread. I, like I'm the most vocal person being like, this is a terrible <laughs> idea. Why would you possibly, what? You're going to get rid of promises, right? And here I am six months later writing this stuff, right? Preaching it. Um, so. well, yeah, it was a good conversation. I, I, I want to erase all records of it, though. Okay, so the idea day. So the idea was a couple of things. Uh, one was, yeah, it, it, you know, academically, it makes sense that if you're just creating an HTTP request, you only want one response from it. A promise maps well to that. But we wanted to compose these HTTP requests as part of a pipeline, as part of an existing stream, and to give them the benefits of being cancelable and abortable, like in the in the example of the type ahead component, where as more characters come into a type ahead, you probably want to cancel the request that's already pending and also cancel any follow-up work that's pending for the previous query you've done for matches for that input. And so we, we wanted to map to that, and observable was just a nice construct. But the other part of it was that with Angular 1, the $HTTP service, a lot of people had been asking us for progress events for it and uh, to be able to see download progress, upload progress, rather than just get a response when it's done resolving. And with promises, that's that's kind of hard. We, there are ways we, we could make it work, but just the the uh, primitive didn't map well to that. And so with Angular 2, we, uh, I don't, I, we haven't implemented it yet, but it's in the design and, and is in progress. But we, we have it where you can actually provide observers to subscribe to these things or to be notified of uh, upload progress and download progress. So you can you know have your loading indicators and things like that. And so we just decided to just make observable the basic construct of HTTP requests for this purpose. And uh, I guess yeah, I guess those are the major reasons why. But Ward can say why he hates that. I'm just kidding. Or, or doesn't hate it. He's he's provided a he's he's, he's busy a, throwing a, up. He can't answer right now. Yeah. Should <laughs> <laughs> be. And if you think about it, right, like a promise is just an observable of a one value, right? Like that's if you squint a little bit, like that's the way to think about it, right? Like a, a, somebody, <laughs> somebody's going to yell at me about it, that. Bro. Somebody's going to yell at me about that, right? But like if you really. <laughs> A promise is just a stream of one value, right? Like that's what well done. Oh, that's yeah. classic. But can we talk about some of the scenarios um, we did with promises and how you would do those with observables? Just to I knew out. you were going to bring. I knew you were going to bring this up. Yeah. <laughs> so let's say we had something simple like uh, I want to go get a customer, and then I wanted to go get that customer's orders, and then I want to go get that customer's orders details. Uh, not that that's a great idea, but with a promise, yeah. we would do that with then, then, then. How would you do that same kind of thing with a with a reservable? So if you're going to take that first request, right? It's going to give you a response of the customer, and then you're going to map that into another request to get the, uh, what did you say, orders from there? Customer yeah, orders, orders and then orders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you're basically going to map, right? Or if you want to do multiple requests, you're going to flat map, or what do we call it now? Merge map? Merge map? Basically, it's maps. So you're going to turn that first that first request or that first response into more requests, and that's all a map operation is. And then again, do the same thing further down. Um, so and, everywhere you did a then before, you basically just do a mapping of some kind. Yeah, you can either do you can either do a map 
which is it's just like a synchronous way of doing that. Or if you're going to do more asynchronous things, right, where, where it, with a, the promise you'd use something like promise.all. So if you wanted to get a list of customers and for each one of those customers mm-hmm. make another request, right, you'd use promise.all and you'd wait for all of it to complete. With an observable, you can use flat map and flat map will allow you to take each of those, uh, those customers, make another asynchronous request and downstream from that, sort of have them one by one, one by one by one. So it's like a, it's like an asynchronous okay. map. Basically. That's what flat map gives us. And how do you handle uh, error conditions? Like we did with promises, we could catch things at multiple levels. How do they work with observables? What do you mean at multiple levels? So we could have a then which accepts in a first and a second parameter uh, and a okay. promise, or we could do a then something dot catch something. Mm-hmm. So in observables, when you're consuming an observable, you have your next function, which only receives... It's kind of like the, what is it called? Internally resolve function, not resolve. Resolved. So the success function. You, so you create a single subscription to an observable, you and your application. And that accepts the first argument is your success function. The second argument is your error function. And it has the third argument, which is the completion function that just calls when the observable says, I'm done, I'm not going to produce any more values. So that's the promise dot then like way of handling errors. And then there's a catch operator that uh, I think it's also called catch and promises, right? Promise dot catch. Yeah. Um, where you can you can uh, handle errors that way. It's also more powerful because you can uh, you can have catches that can actually save the promise and or save save the observable, return a new one to replace the, the source observable and and recover from it. Which you can do with promises. Uh, yeah. It's just a little not quite as straightforward. But it sounds like if if I'm understanding the syntax right, because what we would do in promises a lot is we would have what if our success condition also caused an error. So that's why we always like to do the dot catch anyway. It sounds like we can mm-hmm. do the same thing with observables, though, right? Yep. Well, there aren't as many. I guess I guess you could do catches uh, at intermediary steps to to catch uh, specific errors that happened at the previous step. But yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the kind of thing you could you can actually. There's, I mean, there's a catch when or a catch something like that, which allows you to like pick out specific errors to handle, deal with them, or kind of filter other ones downstream. Well, it's more of a, uh, you want to make sure, for me, it's more of a, I want to make sure that whether my asynchronous call failed or my success function had some bad funky code in it, either way, I want to catch either of those conditions. So that's why I like to do the dot catch or promise, Mm -hmm. but it sounds like we can do the same kind of thing with observables, though. And that that reminds me of another reason why we locked uh, observables for HTTP was the, the retrying of failed requests. If a request fails for any reason, I can just use this retry operator to say, retry this three times, and that will try the request up to three times. What it's doing underneath is is catching the error and retrying again. But there's this retry when method operator as well, where you can actually look at why it failed and get more sophisticated. Like you could you could use exponential fallback to start putting yeah. more delays on your retries. And, and, and this, isn't a, this isn't a knock on about to say on observables, but I think just the general strategy of retrying, I think anybody who's retrying any network call should always have some kind of logic behind it because mm-hmm. you don't just want to retry forever. I mean, that's, that's just a, that's asking for trouble. Yep. And typically, typically most sort of observable operators will have like the basic, you know, retry, and then there's usually like a retry when and a retry until, right? Usually there's a couple of sort of various flavors that give you the ability to, to do specific logic in those things. Is there a retry till denial of disservice? <laughs> <laughs> retry till it explodes. Do you got it? 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 Right. The default uh, retry limit's like ten thousand, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it just it's like 10, 10, times until, or better yet, retry. Oh, I have to retry. I'll send ten this time. Oh, that failed. I'll do a hundred this time. There yeah. you go. Know. Awesome idea. things for hundred. Yeah. Well, you could do all. You could do this stuff within a, a, a catch and a promise, right? Because you do all. You, in other words, you could catch that uh, that the error failed. Right, and then you would analyze it, and you decide whether you, what kind of thing you want to return, which can be the uh, the equivalent of the retry because you're just issuing the XHR request again, assuming that you have the information necessary to do so. It's just so. I mean, I, you could well, do it with callbacks too. Good, that's a pretty good basic difference, though. Or if it, that's another like thing to point out is that an observable of a request, let's say an observable that makes an HTTP request. 
you can resubscribe to that, right? So you can basically reuse that same observable and run the same logic again. And that's something that you can't do with a promise. You have to create a new version of that I'd promise. I have to create right? a brand new request. The information about the request is usually lost to me unless I'm very careful about what I'm passing along. So if I'm lucky, that response that I got back included the original request so that I would be a position to reissue the request. But it's very likely that I won't have exactly what I need in order to be able to reissue it. So there's some advantages there, and I like the composability of it. The advantages are subtle, I think, when more subtle when you're talking about something where you're you're really thinking I'm going to issue one request and uh, yeah, I may retry it. Yeah, I may do this and that. But ultimately, from a consumer's point of view, I'm expecting to issue this request once and get one result. Mm -hmm. I think promises are probably pretty good for that. But and we should the, say, right? Like the, it, it, the only value is you say then instead of subscribe. So you use a method you already know and you save five characters, right? Well, those are very precious. I only have. So I, know, many, I know they are. I, know, I only yeah. have so many keystrokes in my life. Um, but <laughs> but we should say like they they play nicely together, right? Like it's not a question of sort of callbacks versus promises, which don't play nicely, right? Like observables yeah. and promises really interrupt pretty well together. You can kind of, you know, you can start with an observable, you can do a promise in the middle of a stream, and that's fine, right? Like they they are designed sort of from the beginning to play nicely with each other. So it's not necessarily a, a like a either or situation. If you've got a and if you've got a library like the Google Maps API, which returns promises already, right? Like you don't have to wrap that in an observable. You can just use that in the middle of your observable stream. It works fine. I could see people writing code. I'm not sure this is a bad thing, but I could definitely see people writing code well into Angular 2's future where there's both promises and observables mixed in the same code base. And I'm not I necessarily that's, sure that's a, yeah, I think it's going to be a pretty common and probably a decent thing to do. Pretty normal thing to do, I think, right? Like, you, you know, you're not going to say, Especially in Node land, right? That's the other place that, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's just finished converting to promises, right? And I don't think you're advocating, like, let's go rewrite everything in Observable over again, right? Like, it's, they play nicely together. They, they mix and match and really, really well. It's, it's worth noting that Angular 1, it was hard to incorporate outside async libraries with Angular 1 because change detection had no idea to know when they were done or when async operations completed. But with Angular 2, we we made it a lot more interoperable. So you don't have to use Angular 2's HTTP library. You can just as easily use fetch uh, that comes in the browser or XML HTTP request. And if now these responses... It, yes. What's that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Supports it, yes. <laughs> True. So, so yeah, if you want to use fetch, you can use it. Or you could use any other HTTP library that abstracts XHR because of the um, zones implementation in Angular 2 that intercepts all these asynchronous operations. It will automatically run change detection, update the view, so you don't have to do scope digest that you would have had to do in Angular 1. So can I ask you a question? Because this is a podcast, so it's a little. I, I'm trying to mm -hmm. make sure that we can, like, we can, the people listening can kind of conceptualize how we're going to use this, which is kind of what John's initial question was, which I thought was awesome. So I want to go back to like an example you pointed out, Jeff, which was forms. Like I can still use ng model, awesome, but I'm going to do. I'm going. I want to talk about forms for a second. So like. Will I somehow bind like to my form and do like form dot subscribe and then that subscribe will just like send me back like the ID with the value or something or what? How is that going to work? You, uh, so you'll actually the controls in your form. I think we have something on the form itself, an observable Rob, don't we? Yeah, the form but, itself. Okay, so but on the controls, you can each input, for example, each input that has a control associated with it has a property called value changes. And so you would say my input dot value changes dot subscribe. And then you could subscribe to all, all the events from that input. But when you want to compose them together or just do any changes on the form, like when the form submitted, then you would use the forms value changes event. But they're interesting oh, ways. Okay. Once you get the hang okay. of observable composition, then you can do some powerful things with composing the controls uh, observables together. Okay, I see how you're saying what you're saying there. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty cool. I think that's more powerful, and I think it's easier than the callback method well, on, like just using ng model. So what I was really looking for, guys, is I was trying to do something with a promise where I had a service that made the HTTP call, and then basically my controller has no idea where the data is coming from, and then that service I cache the data or I do other things there. 
But basically, the controller or an Angular 2, the component, is uh, basically doesn't know anything about how it's getting its data. Can I still do the same thing, or do I have to do subscribe inside of the controller too? Subscribe to your service. Your service can so, publish whatever it wants. Right. So the service goes off and, uh, and does the uh, the calls, and then you know I'm going to go ahead and publish those and map them. But do I have to subscribe from the component to the service? Well, there's a couple ways you could do it. So I think you could do pretty much the way you're used to doing it today with the promise way, right? Where your your uh, your service sort of publishes a promise, and you dot then, and then you do the dot then the results, and you know you attach that to your controller. So that works, you know, like just in most cases, you can think about it, you can pretty much just replace the word then with the word subscribe and think about it the same way, right? Like at, at the most basic level. But there's some clever things that we can do as well. So Angular 2 has this new ability to sort of bind from the view. So all you'd really have to do is you can just take your service, plug it into your controller, basically. And from the view, say effectively subscribe to the view. So we use the async pipe to do that. Um, and so if you remember, like in, in Angular 1 days, you used to be able to just assign a promise to the controller and then like not have to unwrap the promise, right? You used to be able to just sort of like this dot foos equals something that returns a promise. And that is kind of how it works now in Angular 2. We've got this idea of a pipe. And the pipe will basically unwrap that observable for you or unwrap that promise for you. Is that like the async pipe, but there's like an observable pipe or something? Yeah. Well, the async pipe works with observables or promises. So you can kind of mix okay. and match there and treat some yeah, things the same. Yeah, and I guess what I'm trying to make sure is clarified is that when I'm coding this code or anybody's coding a component, we used to have to know there was a promise and do it then. But effectively, how I got that, we didn't care. So now it sounds like we could in the component do subscribe or we could use pipes. And yeah, definitely. Right? Like you, you, you could, if you know, you can do it the old way if you, if you have to know, but if you assign it to the view, or if you, you know, you just take that service and stick it onto the view to controller, then the pipe will figure it out. The async pipe, whether it's observable or it's promise, it'll pretty much handle it for you. That, that's so again, cool. I appreciate that. Cause I think what everybody's really wondering out there who's thinking about this for the first time is I knew how to do it this way. Tell me how I do it now with uh, observables. And I think that for a lot of, again, most things in Angular 2, we're trying to kind of maintain that ability, right? Like, if you knew how to do it before, it probably still works mostly the same, right? But in most cases, we've added this sort of extra awesome way on top of doing that. And I think that's pretty common across the framework, right? Like, that there's always this sort of comfortable way you're used to doing it, and that pretty much works the same. Um, and then you can kind of opt into some of these much more powerful things, if you like. But yeah, the pipe specifically is really cool because it, it just handles both cases really nicely. You don't even have to worry about it. Awesome. Uh, there's one thing that, that Rob and I were talking about earlier that I want to share just as a possible scenario for reactive programming that I, th I really liked, which is I often want to have uh, keep track of customers. Let's say I want to keep track of customers, and they could be changing, or, or it's orders. Let's say it's orders, and they could be changing, but I don't want to keep hitting the back end all the time. I want to kind of cache them for a period of time, but if I've been, it's been too long since I last got a fresh look at the orders, I'd like it to go out and do that. Well, that would be pretty hard to do with a promise, per se. I think we can make it easy to subscribe to a feed, an orders feed, and have that deliver fresh orders to me on a basis that the consumer doesn't have to know about. In other words, I'm just sitting there in my controller and saying, hey, give me orders. And when the orders change, update it for me, and you'll know, and I don't have to care, just do it. And I think we can arrange for that to happen with this observable-based uh, HTTP stuff. And that's going to be a really nice feature, because I want that in my app. That's a common scenario for me. Yeah, definitely. It's like it's the difference very much, I think, between push and pull, right? So with, with a sort of pull, if you wanted to pull your API from your controller all the time, you'd be pulling values down. And the, the sort of observable way would be upstream, you'd set up a timer and it would just push new values down the stream, right? It's, it's, it's push versus pull, I think, is a good way to think about it. And yeah, so like pulling every 30 seconds is, is two lines of code in, in an observable thing. And it's sort of at the very end of all these little steps, it's really very consistent. You just subscribe at the end and whatever's triggering the changes upstream, right? It's really, really easy to handle. Of course, time will tell. Yep. Time will tell. All right. Well, I'm going to be a jerk and wrap this up because we've been talking. By the time we're done with Pixel, will be over an hour. That's so, too much that fun. Went fast. Yeah. That went fast. Yeah, it Flew by. Wow. Yep. It's a quickie, dude. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do the picks. Jeff, do you want to start us with picks? 
So I read a book recently that was pretty good, and it was called Miracle Morning, and it's a book about so good. waking up early. I've been doing it. Oh, you've read it too. Yeah, so I've been early, and I'm a night owl, and I have never woken up early, but it's been really awesome, and so uh, uh, I wanted to... Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just a few days into it, but it's been really cool so far. I'm hoping I stick with it. Yeah, I do it just about every morning, and it is awesome. What's it, what is it in the sentence? What's what's the difference? What are you doing? So the idea is is that you put together a morning routine, and he gives you all kinds of pointers for waking up and being more awake and things like that. But it sets your day off on the right foot, and then from there, you know, you, you kind of get into a routine for your day, and then you're used to starting it out right. So people put things in there like exercise or meditation or journaling or reading or training or, you know, I, I in mine, I also have things like uh, I have most of those things, but I also have prayer and, you know, scripture study is along with my, you know, reading other books and training and watching videos and stuff like that. No book in the world is going to get me to wake up and write a journal. It's just oh, not you, you could read this one, Rob. I'll, I'll yeah. loan you my audio book copy. You can just uh, do what, he, what Frosty and I do, which is we stay up all night, and then we're ready yeah. to have that session. Be- <laughs> that's totally what I do. <laughs> Before I had kids, that's what I did. Yeah. But it's not really an option anymore. I don't know how Frosty gets away with it. <laughs> he can just answer his kids' questions in his sleep. Yeah, that's true. Rockstar. All right, Frosty, what are your picks? I'm going to do a pick because we're over on time. Uh, short book, easy read, called How We Will Live on Mars. Uh, I read it after reading Elon Musk's biography, and uh, it was super informative. It was like, it's just a short book, and it's a scientist saying, hey, we're not there. We don't know what it's going to be like, but these are likely how it's going to be when we live on Mars. And so it's just going to talk about this inevitable thing that people are going to try and do and the costs and how there will be water. And it's super mind-opening. Like You end the book going, oh, so I guess that uh, we're going to Mars. And like you started going, this is such rubbish. We're not going to Mars. And then you end the book with your mentality of, oh, cool. I guess we're going to Mars. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty cool little book. All right. Uh, Ward, what are your picks? I just uh, read during those late night hours uh, The Phoenix Project, which is a couple of years old. But wow, was that uh, eye opener. It's a it was a gripper. And I can't imagine a book about computer. You know, a, a novel about IT being a gripper, but this was because it starts out with one disaster after another, and you're wondering why the main character doesn't quit because it's so awful. Everything, politics is bad, the technology is bad, the people around them are fighting. It's like, what are you doing in this company? And it gradually, the guy digs his way out through the influence of some Yoda like figure uh, who um, takes you through this whole DevOps and, um, Kanban, you know, world, and I found it both enjoyable and enlightening. So I recommend it if you haven't read. And it's cheap too, eight bucks Kindle. Awesome. So I've got a pick. It's kind of two picks, but anyway, I'm picking RelativeFinder.org, uh, which is really cool. It backs up onto the FamilySearch.org database, and you need an account there, which is kind of why it's two picks. Um, but it doesn't OAuth handshake thing and then it connects and there are two very cool things that it does that i just i thought was way fun and i've been playing with it the last little while and uh anyway so the first thing that it does is it tells you who you're connected to in like historical people so for example it tells me that i have a 10th great grandmother named elizabeth jackson that was uh, involved in the Salem witch trials. Of course, further research told me that she had been tried and executed as a witch during the Salem witch trials, clearly after she had had kids. I also have a 12th great grandfather who came over on the Mayflower. Um, this is all American history. They do have European royalty, Catholic saints and popes as well. I'm related to any number of Declaration of Independence signers and other famous Americans and Europeans, including people like Charles Lindbergh and Amelia Earhart. Um, you know, so it tells you that you're like sixth cousins, you know, however many times removed. So, for example, George Washington and I are fourth cousins ten times removed. Thomas Jefferson, third cousin, seven times removed. Uh, Elvis Presley is like eighth cousins, one time removed or something like that. Barack Obama and I are 13th cousins, one time removed. 
So, I mean, it, it's just kind of fun, you know, it's like, okay, you know, you're related to all of these interesting people. Uh, my wife is 13th cousins with Barack Obama, so I'm actually less related to him than, than she is. Uh, it also turned out that my wife and I are 13th cousins one time removed, which means that I am as closely related to her as I am to Barack Obama. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of fun. And that's the other bit of it is that they have groups. And if you are in the same group as somebody else, then you can find out how you related to them. So, uh, what I did is I set up a group called dev chat because that's where all of my podcasts live. Uh, the password is dev chat, all lowercase. If you go join that group, then you can find out how you're related to me and anyone else in that group. Um, so you can go check it out at relativefinder.com. Uh, one other caveat that I want to put on this is that family search is run by the LDS church. Uh, so they already had my genealogy because I'm a member of the church, but it's all free information and, you know, so if you want to use this, you actually have to put in enough information to connect with your ancestors that are already in there and they have a huge database. So it's probably not going to be a lot of work, but I'm just letting you know that if you aren't already in there and you don't already have an account, you may have to add your parents or grandparents in order to get it to connect. So you reminded me, Chuck, of a Rodney Dangerfield put down. Uh huh. Which is, um, did your mom have any kids that lived? <laughs> awesome. Rob, what are your picks? I would say, like, my first pick is a person, which is strange. Uh, a guy called Andre Stoltz. Uh, he's a big kind of reactive programming guy, and I quote him all the time. He's done a couple of really interesting things. One of them is a, a really good gist called The Introduction to Reactive Programming You've Been Missing. Google that, and that's probably, like, by far the best explanation of how this works that I've ever seen. And he's written a really good framework, and this is like, I'm almost being a bit of a traitor here, name dropping his framework, but here is a framework called Cycle.js. And Cycle.js is, it's something that's kind of really helped me change how I think about programming. So if you're never, never going to use it, I think it's a really cool framework to just try out and like give a little bit of a cycle to. Um, and it kind of distills a lot of what we have been talking about into like its ultimate purest forms. And it's, it's, I think it's a really interesting project to play with. So that would be, that would be my pick. Andre Stoltz, Google him. All right. Well, if people want to know about more about reactive programming in Angular, what should they do? Where should they go? Send me a tweet. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Rob and I gave a talk at Angular Connect. Uh, I think it's called Angular Data Flow on YouTube from Angular yep. Connect. Uh, we, we were the first 10 minutes or so of the talk, and we really simply talk about uh, how we're approaching it in Angular 2. Uh, so it's a, a good short watch to really understand the vision. And I did, a, I did a slightly longer version of that talk last week at uh, OraDev in Sweden, so Google that as well. And it's like the, the kind of expanded version of our Angular Connect talk. Yeah, and finally, there were a couple of talks about this kind of stuff at Angular Remote Conf, and those talks should be out here with by the time this gets released. So, oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, mine from that was Everything is a Stream, and that's mm -hmm. very much like observable focused on that. So. Yep. All right. Well, thank you both for coming. We'll go ahead and wrap this show up, and we'll catch you all next week. Hosting and bandwidth provided by the Blue Box Group. Check them out at bluebox.net. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit c a c h e f l y dot com to learn more. Do you want to have conversations with the Adventures in Angular crew and their guests? Do you want to support the show? Now you can. Go to adventuresinangular.com slash forum and sign up today.